My name is Michael Gaiad, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Richard Duncan, who's the author of The Money Revolution, and uh, it does seem like we may be at the start of a revolution, the way that things are playing out here. A lot of people that I respect, Richard, follow you, and that's why I reached out. For those who are not familiar with who you are, talk about your background, how'd you get involved in markets, and what are you doing now? Sure. Well, first of all, Michael, thank you for having me on the Lead Lag Live. I appreciate it. It's nice to meet you. I started my career in Hong Kong in 1986 when I was 25. I moved to Hong Kong and found a job as a securities analyst looking at the Hong Kong equities. And over the next 10 years, I moved around from Hong Kong to Singapore and Thailand looking at those markets and some of the other Southeast Asian markets. And that was great because Asia was booming at that time. And I also got to see Asia blow into an enormous economic bubble that blew up in 1997. When that happened, I had a consulting job with the IMF in Thailand for three weeks. And then I joined the World Bank in Washington for a couple of years as a financial sector specialist. Then I moved back to Asia as a banking analyst, both on the sales side and the buy side. And in in 2003, I wrote my first book. It it was called The Dollar Crisis, and it did well. And as a result, I got promoted to be the global head of investment strategy for ABN AMRO Asset Management, based in London, looking at all asset classes globally. After that, I moved back and worked for a hedge fund in Singapore for a couple of years. And then about nine years ago, I went off on my own and started MacroWatch. MacroWatch is a video newsletter that I publish every couple of weeks. And I've also written three more books. The most recent one has just come out. It's called The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. So I hope your listeners will check that out. Yeah, and that's a big question, which I want to pick your brain on, because it seems like it's hard to finance anything when leverage is as high as it is. But I want to go first with an understanding. I want you to explain to the audience why you think we're in this position that we're in, because the narratives around COVID supply chain disruptions, I think we all agree that obviously has a massive impact. But we've been in a situation for decades now where there's been a lot of problems building beneath the surface. So talk through, from your vantage point, economic history, in particular, what happened in 1971, which relates to the gold standard, and why that resulted potentially in a regime change, which could be much more dangerous than people realize. Right. I think it's very important for everyone to understand that the economy just doesn't work the way it did when dollars were backed by gold. Uh, When all of classical economic theory was written, gold was the cornerstone of all of that theory. You take away gold and that whole edifice of the economic theory collapses. We have a new economic system now. It works in a different way and it requires a different kind of economic theory to explain it. So here's what happened. In up until 1968, the Fed was required to own gold or gold certificates to back all of the dollars that it created. And it did this from the time it was created in 1913 up until 1968. But in 1968, it no longer had enough gold to issue anyone, not even one more dollar. And so Congress changed the law and they removed that requirement for the Fed to hold any gold backing for the dollars that it created. And this changed everything in a number of ways. I mean, most obviously, afterwards, the Fed was free to create as much money as it dared because it no longer had to have anything to back the money with. And the only constraint there was it was afraid of if it created too much money, it would lead to high rates of inflation. But there are other very important things that changed and really revolutionized the global economy. For instance, and perhaps most importantly, when we were on a gold-backed monetary system, trade between countries had to balance. It's very simple to understand why. If the United States had a very big trade deficit with some other country, then it would have to pay for its deficit with, it would pay with dollars, but the other country could convert those dollars into U.S. gold. And so very quickly, the U.S. gold supply would shrink. And gold was money, so the money supply would shrink. And it would keep shrinking as long as the U.S. had a big trade deficit. So countries did everything in their power to ensure they didn't have trade deficits. And in fact, you can look at the charts. There were no significant trade deficits during the Bretton Woods era, trade balanced. 
But once the U.S. no longer had to back dollars with gold, all that changed. The Bretton Woods system completely broke down in 1971 when Nixon reneged on the country's promise to allow other countries to convert their dollars into gold. But after it took a little while to, for the policymakers to realize this, but starting in the early 1980s, the United States started running very, very large trade deficits with the rest of the world. By the middle of the 80s, the trade deficit had grown from zero to three and a half percent of GDP, which was completely off the charts. This was by the mid 80s. By 2006, the trade deficit had grown to six percent of US GDP. In 2006, the trade deficit, the current account deficit, was 6% of GDP. That was $800 billion in that one year alone. So as the U.S. trade deficit became larger and larger, of course, this benefited the rest of the world enormously because their trade surpluses became larger and larger. So one country after another was able to industrialize primarily in Asia by selling goods to the United States. And it was Japan, and then Taiwan and Korea. I got here, it was Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, later on Vietnam and China. All of these countries boomed and industrialized and had their miracles as a result of exporting to the United States. But from the United States point of view, the real significance of this is that when the US was able to buy things from countries with very low wages, this put extreme downward pressure on US inflation. Up until then, if the Fed printed a lot of money, or if the U.S. government had very large budget deficits and overstimulated the, the economy, we just had a more or less a closed domestic economy. And very quickly, we would run out of industrial capacity. The steel factories would be working at full capacity. The automobile plants would be working at full capacity. And everybody would have a job. So it would lead to wage push inflation spirals like what we saw in the late 1960s and 70s. But once we started running these massive trade deficits with the rest of the world, we no longer had this closed domestic economy. We had a global economy. And the population of the world is 23 times larger than the population of the U.S. And most of these people in other countries earn very much less than the Americans do. For example, when I first got to Hong Kong, I would travel across the border into China. And you could see factories as far as the eye could see full of 19-year-old women making $3 a day. And it was clear that this was going to have very profound implications. It was going to put downward pressure on prices. It was also going to result in a significant deindustrialization of the United States. But the real significance here is that it drove the inflation rate lower and lower. The Fed, particularly under Bernanke, always likes to claim credit for getting the inflation rate down. But really, they, after Paul Volcker, they, the Fed didn't really have very much to do with driving down the inflation rate. It was globalization. And so once the inflation rate was very low, and by the way, between the year 2000 and, say, the beginning of 2020, the inflation rate was below the Fed's 2% inflation target on average. It was 1.7% during those 20 years. So the Fed was having a hard time keeping the inflation rate high enough. And so with very low inflation, what this meant was that the government was able to get away running very large budget deficits. And the Fed was able to print trillions of dollars and finance these budget deficits as necessary to allow the government to finance its borrowing and still keep the interest rates low. So this radically changed the way the not only the U.S. economy worked, but the way the global economy worked. And suddenly the government and the Fed could play a very active role in managing the economy through borrowing and the creation of money. And at the same time, credit exploded. The Fed steadily reduced the required reserve ratio that the banks were required to hold against their deposits, and credit exploded. For instance, total credit or total debt, two sides of the same coin. In the United States, that's government debt, household sector debt, financial sector debt, corporate debt, all the debt. It first went through $1 trillion in 1964. By 2007, on the verge of that crisis, it had expanded more than 50 times to $54 trillion in just 47 years. And now total credit has grown to $90 trillion. So a 90-fold increase 
just in less than 60 years. So this explosion of credit drove economic growth. The credit growth became the main driver of economic growth in the U.S. And the U.S. demand became the main driver of global economic growth. But during this process, the U.S. economy became addicted to credit. It, if, it do, if credit doesn't grow by at least 2% adjusted for inflation, then the U.S. economy goes into recession. That happened nine times between 1950 and 2009. So if the U.S. doesn't have 2% credit growth adjusted for inflation, it goes into recession. And if credit begins to contract, if it, as it did in 2009, then the country would go into depression. And so I think our economic system, I say that our economic system evolved from capitalism into creditism. Capitalism was an economic system driven by businessmen who would invest. Some of them would make a profit. They would save that profit or accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat. It was pretty difficult, but that's the way capitalism generated economic growth. But that's not how our system generates economic growth. Our system is driven by credit creation and consumption, and more credit creation and more consumption. And as long as credit keeps growing, then everything is wonderful. But if credit grows by less than 2%, we have a recession. And heaven forbid, if credit contracts, the economy would spiral into a debt deflation spiral and have a depression. So th there's a lot of interesting things about this discussion I want to talk through here. As I hear you talk through that history, it sounds to me like the experiment of going off of the gold standard ended up working despite the Fed's excess liquidity and the government's excess liquidity because it was countered by other major secular trends that were happening at the time. You mentioned globalization as a disinflationary force. I'd argue also labor force participation, you know, as women were increasingly entering the labor force, you know, was a part of that. And consumerism obviously kept on increasing throughout that, that those several decades. When you look at economic data prior to 1971, and again, the removal of the gold standard, it sounds to me like you believe that any kind of historical analogy or way of analyzing past prior to 1971 really doesn't matter because, to your point, the economy works completely differently under a faith-based system versus a gold-based system. Well, so in this book, The Money Revolution, the first part, there are three parts. The first part is a history of the Fed. It traces the history of the Fed from 1913 up until the present. And what you see is that the Fed had to change frequently in response to various crises. For example, the Fed didn't open its doors until, well, it was, it was created by an act of law in December 1913. Just as, within a year, the, the world changed radically because World War I began. And, by, and just for the audience's edification, and the reason it was created was what? It was the 1907 banking crisis, I believe. That's right. It, these banking crises were so disruptive to the economy but the Fed was created to provide short-term, ideally short-term liquidity to the banking system when everyone is running for the doors and even good borrowers and sound companies couldn't access any credit and ended up going bankrupt, creating very severe economic depressions again and again through the 19th century, culminating in, the, in 1907. And so afterwards, enough was enough, and the bankers and the politicians got together and they said, we need to have a central bank to provide short-term liquidity in periods of banking crises so that these crises don't become very horrific and lead to depressions unnecessarily. So then, very soon after the Fed starts its operations in 1914, the U.S. enters World War I in 1917, and the Fed has to play a very active role in ensuring that the U.S. government can borrow all the money it needs to borrow at low interest rates. And it did. That's, that was not part of the original plan at all. The Fed was supposed to be passive, but it had to end up being quite active to help finance World War I. And then it did so on a much larger scale during World War II. Without the Fed, it would have not been possible for the government to, to borrow all the money it did to fight World War II at low interest rates. The Fed created a lot of money, just as it does through quantitative easing, and helped finance the war. So again and again, the Fed has had to create new methods of managing monetary policy, usually in response to crises. 
with the most recent two being the crisis of 2008, and then again, the COVID pandemic crisis in 2020. And so overall, they have done a, quite a good job. Their one big failure was when they prevented the Great Depression from occurring in the 19, in 1930. The stock market crashed in 29. The first wave of bank failures occurred in 1930. There were three waves, the worst being in 1933. And the Fed didn't provide enough liquidity to keep those banks from collapsing. And so the economy went into a Great Depression. Unemployment went up to 25%. GDP contracted by 45%. And the Depression didn't end until World War II started. And only then did the government come in with massive fiscal stimulus to fight the war with the Fed financing that with massive money creation to finance the borrowing, and that ended the depression. So when we got to 2008 and another bubble, of course, there had been a bubble in the 20s, and that bubble blew up in 1930. When we got to the next great bubble crisis in 2008, that bubble started to deflate. But rather than letting it deflate as they did during the 1930s, this time they did everything in their power to keep it inflated. The government ran trillion dollar budget deficits for four years in a row. And over seven years, the government borrowed seven trillion dollars between 2008 and 2014. And the Fed created three and a half trillion dollars to help finance that government borrowing at low interest rates. And that worked. They reflated the economy despite the banks all being on the verge of collapse and bankruptcy. They managed to reflate the economy and we didn't collapse into a great depression. The economy recovered, and here we are 13 years or more down the road without having had to endure a 1930-style Great Depression as a result of the combination of government fiscal deficit spending financed by monetary policy and quantitative easing. And then they did exactly the same thing in 2020 when COVID threatened to send the U.S. into another Great Depression. The since COVID started, the government has borrowed roughly $7 trillion, and the Fed has created roughly $5 trillion to finance that government borrowing. That, and the combination of the government borrowing and sending out stimulus checks to all the Americans and making loans that were forgiven to many businesses, that prevented the COVID pandemic from turning into a Great Depression. Without that stimulus, the Americans would have defaulted on their mortgage payments, on their car loans, on their credit cards. The unemployment rate was 14.8% and going up. And had the Americans started defaulting, then all the banks would have failed. And if the banks had failed, of course, we would have gone into complete depression. So the government intervened just as it did in 2008. And now the economy is bigger than it was before COVID started. The unemployment rate's 3.6%. It was very successful, other than this time we have ended up with high rates of inflation. Now, the most important question is, why did we get very high rates of inflation in 2022 when we didn't? Real, real quick, because before you go down the road, I think this is interesting, because yeah, as you're talking through this, it, it kind of dawned on me that you, know, you can make a case that the last several crises have been really driven by the Fed itself. So you can argue that the great financial crisis was driven by the Federal Reserve keeping rates incredibly low and not doing anything about Soaring housing prices, right? So then you saw the effect of excess liquidity afterwards, which meant even more liquidity to re-leverage. I'd argue that the 2011 crisis, which lasted for the last second part of the year, where you had the U.S. debt downgrade and eurozone crisis, also partially because of the Fed, because of excess liquidity, which enabled the U.S. government to have so much debt to the point where credit worthiness was questioned. And I've also argued that the 2020 crash probably, although you never really know, would have not been as severe had the entire system, again, not been as leveraged, right? So if we go with the idea that the Fed creates the conditions for liquefying in crises, the problem becomes that every time they reliquify, they create more leverage. So the problem ends up getting even bigger conceivably in terms of whenever a margin call hits, for whatever reason, the Fed is creating the very monster they're trying to fight. Well, so let's go through those. You mentioned in the lead up to the property bubble, the Fed between 2004 and 2006, the Fed actually increased the federal funds rate 17 times from 1% to five and a quarter. But despite 
that a very big increase in the federal funds rate. Just imagine if the federal funds rate were five and a quarter today. Despite that, the 10-year bond yield barely budged. The 10-year bond yield barely went up. Now, why was that? Well, here's the explanation. During that time, the U.S. trade deficit was so large, it was throwing off so much money into the global economy, and in particular, going to China. Now, so here's how it works. Chinese companies sell their goods in the United States. They get paid in dollars. They take their dollars back to China, and they want to convert their dollars into the local currency, the Chinese yuan. But if they did that in a free market, the conversion of that many dollars would push the yuan up to a very high level and kill China's export growth, and China would stop growing. So the People's Bank of China intervenes to prevent that from happening. And what they do is they create yuan from thin air. They buy the dollars from the exporters who've brought the dollars into the country. And those exporters then have yuan, and they can deposit them or do whatever they want with them. But the People's Bank of China has dollars, lots of dollars. And once they have the dollars, they have to invest them in U.S. dollar-denominated assets. And they had so many dollars, and you can see this in the buildup of their foreign exchange reserves. Foreign exchange reserves went from something like $2 trillion in the year 2000 to $12 trillion by 2012 or something like that, the creation of $10 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. So this is effectively a foreign central bank carrying out quantitative easing. So what we it just requires one more step. We know the Fed creates dollars and uses those dollars to buy government bonds. And that pushes up the price of the bonds, and that pushes down their yields. Well, the same thing is true with the People's Bank of China and the other central banks who do this. But there's one more step. They create their own money, yuan, and with that yuan, they then buy dollars. And with those dollars, then they buy treasury bonds. And that pushes up the price of the bonds, and that pushes down the yields of the bonds. So in the lead up to the property bubble, the Fed really tried quite valiantly to bring it under control with 17 rate hikes, but there was so much foreign capital coming in from abroad that it put upward pressure on bond prices and held the 10-year bond yields down, and that caused the Fed to lose control over interest rates, so they couldn't prevent the property bubble from happening, and it blew up. It wasn't so much liquidity, dollar liquidity created by the Fed, it was global liquidity, money liquidity created by foreign central banks led by the People's Bank of China that had the same effect as quantitative easing. It flooded the U.S. with liquidity and blew it into a bubble. And then that bubble popped in 2008, requiring a dramatic response from both the Treasury in terms of borrowing and spending and the Fed in terms of money creation and financing the government debt. Let's continue with this transition of capitalism to creditism because... It seems to me that this is sort of the inevitable path that any developed economy ultimately goes towards. And I, you can reference Japan, you can reference Europe, but I I keep, this has been a theme of mine for a while in these spaces that I find it hard to envision a scenario where in the very, very long term, capitalism can coincide with democracy. And I know that sounds dramatic, but if we think about incentives, you never get voted in for austerity, right? You only get voted in for promising more which means that debt has only one direction it ultimately can go, which is higher. And that means that, to your point, you need to have that credit growth 2% after inflation every single year just to survive and somewhat keep the status quo. Have we really have we all been living in this kind of strange anomaly over the last 40, 50 years of progress as a society, as a people? And is are we maybe headed for an environment going forward where things are just going to be much, much more difficult and much more different than what we're used to? Well, so first of all, you know, I think it's important for everyone to understand that no one planned this. This just evolved. I mean, once the link between money and gold was broken, things started changing in very strange ways. And the this explosion of credit that I discussed earlier and the U.S. trade deficits, they have pulled hundreds of millions of people out around the world out of extreme poverty. So we've had the biggest global economic boom in history. China looks like the Emerald City and the Wizard of Oz today because of this, what we've been discussing. So a lot of good things have resulted from this. Had the U.S. stuck to the gold standard or the Bretton Woods system, they might not have been able to spend enough to bankrupt the Soviet Union, for instance. The Soviet Union might still be around. So a number of good things have occurred as a result of this. 
system that has just evolved. Now, how long can this go on? It can probably go on for quite a long time, at least if there's globalization. Let's just assume that globalization survives and persists for the moment. Now, look at the U.S. government debt is about 125% of GDP. Japan's government debt is twice that high. Japan's government debt was where we are now about 20 years ago. So you, so that suggests the U.S. government's debt could double relative to GDP before we get to the same level of where Japan is. But, you know, probably this can't, maybe this, we don't know how high the government debt to GDP can go. Japan is not suffering from hyperinflation or extremely high government bond yields. The bond yields are practically zero, and so is the well. The inflation rates picked up some now, but it's still less than three percent. But the real purpose of my book, the Money Revolution: How to Finance the Next American Century, is to try to take advantage of this new economic environment we find ourselves in to have a strategy where we actually make use of all of this credit in a productive way, so that we can grow our way out of this situation that we find ourselves in by in investing in new industries and new technologies on a very aggressive scale. Now, this book was first cons- written. It was written during 2018 and 2019. It was a, pretty much ready to be published by the time COVID started. And what it advocates is that since we're now in this place, I mean, so this is the world I was looking at, at that time, 2018 and 2019. The U.S. government had just reflated us out of the 2008 crisis by increasing government debt by $7 trillion. And the Fed had created $3.5 trillion over that seven-year period through QE1, 2, and 3. And the highest rate of inflation that we got was in 2011. The inflation rate, the CPI, peaked at 3.8%. And by early 2015, the CPI was negative again for a few months. We actually had deflation again. So massive trillion-dollar government spending, multi-trillion-dollar money creation by the Fed, and no inflation. So my conclusion was, well, if if that's the case, if this is the environment we're living in now, then how about this? Let's have the government borrow on a multi-trillion-dollar scale over the next over a decade and invest aggressively in 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 cooperation with the private sector invest aggressively in new industries and new technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, robotics, genetic engineering, biotech, nanotech. Because after all, they had just done this on a very large scale and it hadn't led to high rates of inflation. So that's the argument and how to finance next American century. But lo and behold, as soon as the book's finished, we get hit by COVID. And it's unclear how much the government's going to have to spend. It's unclear how much money the Fed is going to print. So I had to sit on the book for a year and uh, more than a year. And it turned out the government spent, borrowed during that time, $7 trillion. The Fed more than doubled its total assets by creating $5 trillion. And so by the middle of last year, things were looking more certain. So after revising a couple of chapters, I assumed that Before the inflation was still low in the middle of last year when I hit the print button, but the COVID never stopped. We got not only the first round of COVID, after that came the Delta round, uh, which the first round didn't affect Asia at all, or very limited. But this Delta hit Asia. Omicron has hit Asia very hard. China's locked down Shanghai and parts of Beijing. This is creating ongoing supply chain disruptions that have led to high rates of inflation. And just when there might have been some light at the end of the tunnel on that front with the possibility of supply chain bottlenecks being worked out before too much longer, Russia invades Ukraine and suddenly oil prices spike and wheat prices spike and all kinds of chemicals and metals all spike. So this is, sadly for me, under really undermined my argument that the government could get away with this without causing high rates of inflation. but. Again, on the other hand, I wasn't proposing that the government borrow $7 trillion in two years. I was suggesting multi-trillion dollars over a decade. So we'll see. Maybe what I've advocated in this book, which I think we really need to do, 
for a number of reasons, including national security. Maybe this is not going to be possible if globalization breaks down. This globalization has been the main economic development in my career, in my lifetime. It's driven down inflation. It's allowed the government and the Fed to manage the economy. But we may be in a, it's been a complete paradigm shift. It has been a money revolution. The catalyst was the moment when we stopped backing dollars with gold that set off a money revolution that's played out over the last five decades. But we met, it was a paradigm shift. But we may now be experiencing the reversal of that paradigm shift with COVID's never going to stop spreading. Maybe we're going to get more and more variants that are deadlier and lead to perpetual supply chain disruptions. You know, in a worst case scenario, the war in Ukraine could spread further throughout Europe and elsewhere. You know, that's the worst case scenario. We don't know. There's a best case scenario where COVID goes away and the war ends and everything returns to normal a couple of years from now. I hope that's the case. I think there's a reasonable chance that is the case. And if it turns out that is the case, then within not too many years from now, we'll probably once again, because of the extreme downward pressure on prices from globalization and the fact that 2 billion people live on less than $3 a day, that globalization will re-exert its deflationary forces and we'll once again be perhaps in a situation where the inflation rate is below the Fed's 2% inflation target. At which point, perhaps we could then undertake this you know, decade-long, multi-trillion-dollar investment program in the industries of the future. Yeah, and I want to bring up some of the audience. And by the way, for those that are interested in taking a look at the book, Money Revolution, available on Amazon. But let's get some of the audience up here. Let me maybe add a little thought because it's interesting, right? So in the context of this creditism kind of idea, right? Uh, it's hard to imagine creditism being a system if you have a continuously strong currency. But maybe Richard kind of riff on that for a bit. Yes, sure. But so that's very, you bring up so many interesting points there. But China's trade surplus with the US is still at its peak level. It's, I didn't see the latest numbers, but it's roughly $400 billion a year. It's more than a billion dollars a day. So it's not like they couldn't withstand a little drop in their trade surplus for whatever reason. And that $400 billion, they're accumulating it. And they're taking those dollars and they're buying U.S. government bonds and other U.S. dollar denominated assets. And that's one reason why we've got 8.6% inflation and the 10 year bond yield is below three and a half percent. You know, that's crazy. Why isn't the 10 year bond yield a lot higher? Where are the bond vigilantes? One of the reasons, and there are a number of reasons, but one of them is because the U.S. still has this, the current account deficit this year will be more than $1 trillion. It hit a new record high last year. It's going to be very high again this year, even higher still this year. And so that those dollars are going to go abroad. They're going to be accumulated there. And then they're going to be reinvested back in U.S. dollar denominated assets, keeping downward pressure on the 10-year government bond yields. Now, China does have a lot of problems, but they I've been, I watched the Asia crisis countries blow up in 1997 because they were all big credit bubbles. And China, I thought, would be the same. But somehow, China has managed its economy year after year, and they have kept their bubble inflated and inflating. And it's gotten to the point now where China is becoming a real threat to the United States in terms of national security, because China is now investing more in research and development than the United States is. Back in the year 2000, the United States invested eight times as much as China did in R&D. But in 2019, China overtook the US in R&D investment. And at this rate, if current growth trends continue, by 2030, that year, China will invest 40% more in research and development than the United States does. And this, as a percent of GDP, total investment in China is 44%. Total investment in the US is only 21%. So China invests twice as much as the U.S. does in overall terms. And that's why China has hypersonic missiles and 5G and the United States doesn't. This is one of the reasons that I feel so strongly that we really, in the United States, we desperately need to undertake a very aggressive investment program in basic research and development targeting the industries of the future. Because otherwise, we are going to be surpassed very soon by China economically, technologically, and militarily. 
And here, the worry is that the country that develops artificial intelligence first, artificial general intelligence, the point where machines are more intelligent, as intelligent as humans, afterwards, they become exponentially more, more intelligent. Whoever gets there first is going to have the rest of the world at its mercy. And at this rate, it's going to be China, unless the United States radically rethinks what it's doing in terms of its current level of investment in these new industries and technologies. By, by the way, so real quick on that, on that point, because I think that's interesting, because it's that the, you're, I think, making the argument that inflation is not going to last very long term because that AI, that technology is, uh, I would assume, going to only make prices lower because you're not going to have the high labor to cost to factor into the price of goods. Yes, that's still some time out, a bit beyond our current worries about how long this inflation enough, cycle right. is going to last. But I think we have to make the decision. Even I hope that these inflationary pressures quickly go away. But even if they don't, we're going to deci- have to decide as a democracy, as a society, how much inflation we might ha- be willing to tolerate to ensure that we are not conquered by China in the not too distant future. Yes, everyone agrees that the United States has the best universities in the world now, but the Chinese are absorbing this knowledge as quickly as they possibly can, putting it to good use. And they are very hard working and hard studying. And it's not going to take them very long to you know, match us. It's not like we have the monopoly on brain power. And certainly we don't have the monopoly on hard work relative to what the Chinese are willing to put in these days. So yes, this is, this is no, I don't, I'm not anti-China for that matter. And I'm certainly not anti-Chinese. It's just never a good idea for one country to allow another country to become much more powerful than it is. History shows us again and again that countries with te- great technological advantage rarely treat their inferiors kindly. So we don't want to be in a position where we lose our technological advantage that we've enjoyed now for a century or so. And there's no reason for us to, because we can easily afford to finance a multi-trillion dollar investment program over a decade. I mean, just for instance, in just one month, in April 2020, during the worst of the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the government in one month borrowed $1.4 trillion in one month. And during that quarter, the second quarter of 2020, the government borrowed $2.8 trillion in just three months. And the Fed, during that time, the Fed created enough money to finance roughly 70% of that. So that demonstrates how easy it would be for the U.S. to finance a multi-trillion dollar investment program over a 10-year period. Now, in just three months, they did a multi-trillion dollar borrowing spree to get us through the pandemic. But China is just one of the reasons we should make this sort of investment. Another reason is an investment on that kind of scale really has the potential to, first of all, ignite a new technological revolution that would turbocharge U.S. economic growth and productivity, not to mention all of the wealth that it would generate. But on top of that, and even more importantly, that kind of investment would give us the potential of curing all the diseases. For instance, right now, the National Cancer Institute, its annual budget is $6 billion a year. They are charged with curing cancer. $6 billion a year is not curing cancer. The Up until very recently, the Fed was creating $120 billion every month. So the National Cancer Institute's budget is equal to 5% of one month of QE at its recent peak. I love that. Uh, keep going with that. This is I, you're making me smile as I'm hearing this because this is about perspective. Keep going. So you know, and it, and in the book, in the part three of the book, it's all about how to finance the next American century through these investments. I show again and again all the examples of where the U.S. is investing in research and development now, and how radically those budgets could be expanded with a ten-year, multi-trillion-dollar investment program, and show how easily we could afford to do this. And if we do. You know, we really have a chance of curing all the diseases, curing cancer, curing heart disease, curing kidney disease and Alzheimer's disease. And that way, we wouldn't have to worry about Social Security and Medicare going bankrupt 30 years in the future or whatever. You know, we could expand life expectancy, you know, potentially by decades. So this is a once in history opportunity 
And it was so much of a no-brainer before COVID got in the way because the case was so easy to make before we got this spike in inflation. We had just come through 2008. The government had radically expanded its government borrowing and spending and the Fed had financed it all and there was no inflation. So hopefully we're going to return to that sort of environment within the not too distant future. And if we do, we certainly should invest on this scale. Now, before your other callers start calling in and attack and attacking this idea, let me just say that what I'm proposing in the book is this could be done following not through the government management of these projects. My idea is the government would fund the projects and set up joint venture companies with the private sector. For instance, the most 10,000, the 10,000 most promising American entrepreneurs and scientists could enter into joint venture companies with the United States government, with the United States funding these companies lavishly in an exchange, keeping a 60% equity stake. And with the entrepreneurs and the scientists managing these companies and keeping a 40% equity stake. And so then when one of these companies invents a, a cure for cancer, it becomes enormously profitable. It could be listed on NASDAQ for how many trillion dollars? In which case, the American taxpayer would own 60% of it. And so this kind of investment project would produce such extraordinary technological breakthroughs and new industries that we can only dream of now that it would become extraordinarily profitable. It would turbocharge economic growth rather than causing government debt to GDP to expand. It would cause it to contract as these things became profitable and started to pay off. And so easily financeable and the results would be completely revolutionary. And, Let's would, go. And, and finally, it would ensure U.S. national security for generations to come. Okay, well, there were two questions there. Let's start with the first one. You were saying, given the political environment in the U.S., it's very unlikely that politicians would ever go for what I'm proposing. And I've been talking about this idea for a number, many years, frankly. And people have all, all often said that to me. You can't really believe the government would ever do anything like that. Well, actually, some good news that the book has had over the last year is that Congress has actually taken steps in this direction now. Last year, the Senate passed a $250 billion bill called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act to invest in new industries and technologies, all the ones I described, with $52 billion in particular going to the creation of or building out semiconductor manufacturing facilities in the United States. Then in February this year, the House passed a very similar bill, except this one was $350 billion, called the America Competes Act, again, targeting all these industries of the future, and again, with $52 billion going to semiconductor manufacturing. So now these two bills are in reconciliation. Hopefully, they're going to come together soon and be signed by the president and become law. So somewhere between 250 and 300 billion well, that's not multi-trillion, but you know, I'll accept that as a first step in the right direction and a big step in the right direction. And the reason they did this in both bills, make it very clear, is the politicians have finally woken up to the threat being posed to us by China, to our national security going forward. It's all spelled out in the bills. There's no, no, no doubt about it. Senator Schumer, when he was still minority leader a couple of years ago, said that one of the first things he would do is try to pass an act that would invest $100 billion in new industries and technologies. And he made this speech in front of the military establishment community in Washington. And he said, because we're about to be overtaken by China and artificial intelligence and in other respects, and we can't allow that to happen. So at the time, I thought I was very happy to hear that, but $100 billion over five years is not going to do the trick. I tweeted and said, Senator Schumer, I'll see your $100 billion and raise you $9.9 trillion over 10 years. And so that's why they're doing it. They are doing it. So they have already moved in this direction. And hopefully they'll just continue moving in that direction and invest even more aggressively than the start. Now, your other question also is very important. How, if these new industries displace existing workers, then something will have to be done to retrain them or, and otherwise, or otherwise give them financial support until they can be retrained or the next generation can be retrained. Now, that's a different matter. It's related to, this would probably lead to increased income inequality as well. 
So those are matters for society to decide on a on, for, for itself. Should we have people who have more than 100 billion given the power they can use, obtain by throwing that money around? Now, this is something for us to also for us to decide. How, what should the tax rate be? But I don't want to take a strong position on that subject because I want to stick to just one, one position that I want to defend. And what I want to defend is to persuade the American public and U.S. policymakers that the United States can and should and must undertake a very aggressive investment program in new industries and technologies. I'll let other people fight for Maybe I'll join the fight if I can get this get this idea going. But until then, I'm, I want to be laser focused on just one one fight, rather than starting talking about taxes and income redistribution, wealth redistribution. But those are all subjects that society should think carefully about. Let's get up here for a question. And everybody here again, make sure you follow Richard on Twitter and check out his book as well. I'm not getting paid to say that. I just think that. This is an interesting conversation, and uh, Richard obviously has a unique way of expressing things. Maybe on, on this good closing thought on your end, on this point about effectiveness of all of this expansion of spending, and both monetary and fiscal. I've, I've been making this argument recently, which sounds a little bit odd, but I do think there's something to it, that the multiplier effect seems to be broken in that you're not seeing money flow into areas that Traditionally, you have seen them flow into, you've seen them flow into commodities and things which actually are typically not where most people will allocate capital to. So money is, instead of flowing, going to financial assets, it's now going much more to real assets. And that's what creates this kind of inflationary pressure. With given a point about, this is more about the liquidity that's been released as more so than the supply chains. It seems to me that this is a very nasty cycle that we could be in because you cannot remove liquidity too quickly because that risks a global margin call where you have all this leverage suddenly getting unwound, which is an overreaction on the other side. But on the other hand, there's societal discontent the longer that this high inflation persists. Right. So, yes. So on his point, there is certainly some considerable truth to what you said in terms of the stimulus has provided more spending power. Now, a couple of things. I think that, of course, the policymakers didn't know how bad things would be. And they probably ended up overdoing it somewhat, but they didn't know at the time. Had they not done anything, then we probably would have collapsed into a Great Depression and there would have been extreme deflation, not only in the U.S., but all around the world. So they ended up giving us what, three big stimulus packages. The first one was in March 2020. The next one was $900 billion in December 2020. And what was it? Another almost two trillion in March 2021. So yes, that gave people spending power that they didn't have before and they spent it on manufactured goods, creating a more of a shortage or more demand for manufactured goods than for services. And they couldn't get the manufactured goods in part because of the supply chain bottlenecks. But that stimulus is gone now. The last stimulus was more than a year ago and there aren't going to be any more big stimulus packages. So if that was the cause or if that contributed to inflation, that's going to now dissipate very rapidly and will be, should lead to disinflation or should help the inflation rate come down significantly going forward. And the Fed, of course, they, they try to do their best, but they can't plant any more wheat and they can't drill for oil. They can't do anything on the supply side in terms of expanding supply. They can only affect inflation by dampening down demand. And that means they're going to have to increase interest rates until they destroy demand by, one, throwing a lot of people out of work and causing the unemployment to go up and consumption to go down, and two, by letting the stock market fall so that that destroys wealth and also deters consumption and causes with less demand, again, leading to lower prices. So that's what they're now in the process of doing. They were slow in getting off the start. They only stopped quantitative easing in, in March. And now they've just really begun quantitative tightening today. And it's going to take more interest rate hikes because there's a lot of downward pressure on bond yields. As I mentioned before, the U.S. trade deficit is going to throw off a trillion dollars abroad and that's going to be accumulated at those dollars abroad that are reinvested in U.S. dollar-denominated assets. 
putting upward pressure on bond prices and downward pressure on bond yields. And on top of that, the Fed has created so much liquidity within the United States already, not only bank reserves, but now there's part in reverse repurchase agreements at the Fed. And the Treasury general account has about $700 billion in it. So all in all, the amount of liquidity parked in the Fed is significantly above $6 trillion. This is going to take quite a lot of quantitative tightening before that liquidity gets erased. Quantitative tightening is on track to destroy about a trillion dollars a year. So it's, so in the meantime, this liquidity in bank reserves and in reverse repurchase agreements is also going to exert downward pressure on 10-year bond yields and therefore on all interest rates across the spectrum. But the one thing that we can count on that will drive bond yields higher is the federal funds rate. As the Fed increases the federal funds rate, right now the federal funds rate is at one and a half to 1.75%. The Fed makes that happen because it pays 1.65% on bank reserves. That means the banks will not lend to anybody for less than 1.65% because they can earn that much from the Fed. The Fed pays money on bank reserves, and that's how it makes the federal funds rate go up. Right now, so the 10-year government bond yield is about 3.4%. is considerably above the federal funds rate. But the Fed is now telling us that the federal funds rate is going to hit 3.4% by the end of this year and 3.8% by the end of next year. And that's probably you know way too low. It'll probably be significantly higher than that, unless there's a very severe recession sometime soon. As the ten-year, as the federal funds rate goes up, that will set the floor below the ten-year bond yield. And of course, everything else moves off the bond yield, including mortgages, which have gone about ten to six percent over the last few days in some places. I've heard. So we don't. There's a lot of downward pressure on bond yields for, because there's so much liquidity in the world. But the thing that will set the floor is the federal funds rate. And this is not how things worked in the past, but that's how it works now. And as the Fed keeps hiking the federal funds rate, perhaps quite quickly, that's going to put upward pressure on bond yields. And that's going to put downward pressure on the stock market and on the property market and on all asset classes, particularly the highest risk asset classes. And it's likely to throw the U.S. into recession with the unemployment rate moving considerably higher as a very large number of Americans lose their jobs. And this will bring the inflation rate back down. On that rosy assessment of the future, I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, make sure you follow Richard Duncan here and check out his book, Money Revolution on Amazon. Richard, hey, I Michael, really appreciate Go ahead, Richard. Could yeah. I just uh, ask your listeners also, if they'd like to check out my work, they can visit my website at richardduncaneconomics.com. That's richardduncaneconomics.com. There, I have a video newsletter that I sell on a subscription basis. It's called Macro Watch. You can check it out. And if you'd like to subscribe at a 50% discount, use the discount coupon codes. You can subscribe at 50% off. That's Macro Watch at richardduncaneconomics.com. And my Twitter handle is at papermoneyecon, at papermoneyecon. But yeah, please follow me on Twitter. And Michael, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed this. This is the first Spaces conversation I've ever done. Yeah, I think it was worthwhile, definitely. So thank you everybody for joining and Richard will be in touch. Appreciate it.